Hey guys, welcome to GraphQL Radio, the GraphQL podcast. Uh, today we're joined by uh, two very, very early adopters of GraphQL, uh, Jordan and Matt. Can you guys please introduce yourselves? Sure. I'm Jordan Husney, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Parable, and this is Matt Crick. Yeah, I'm uh, the lead developer of Parable. Nice. Um, so for the audience that doesn't know, what is Parable? So Parable is a software that helps teams prioritize, uh, particularly teams that work across different tools. And we also have some nefarious other directions that we want to go into after that. Um, but we're recognizing that um, people at work today, uh, teams um, are often blending different disciplines. So you have engineers working together with support folks. The engineers might use something like Jira GitHub, support folks, something like Zendesk. And uh, if the team lead is trying to decide between, hey, do we invest in implementing new features or do we invest in servicing customer support tickets? Um, those decisions need to be made and often need to be made together as a team and that clarity and, and demonstrating progress helps people feel um, like they're making um, better use of their time at work, more meaning, and uh, better business results. Awesome. Yeah, I, I checked a look, took a look at your product. It's like beautiful. It looks really nice um, and it looks like uh, the UX really makes sense for a cross-functional team. And, uh, Thank you. Um, my next question is a little bit about Parable, and uh, we're going to get into the tech in a, in a little bit, but uh, how'd you guys come up to to this this product idea? Like, how'd you stumble upon this Oh, that's product? a great question. Ooh. Really good question. Um, so, um, well, when my co-founder and I started this business, and my co-founder, Taya, she's in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I had just finished working for a really excellent management consultancy called Undercurrent that um, is no longer in business, but they, um, through a story that's best told over a beer, um, they ended up living on through uh, other consultancies that started um, off the back of them. And Undercurrent uh, specialized in uh, workplace culture and preparing really large Fortune 100s for um, the future of work, meaning uh, that different businesses, different large businesses had different problems. Either they couldn't retain staff because working for them was not as awesome as it could be, um, changing work attitudes. Millennials, for example, um, notoriously don't like being told what to do, but this generation is inheriting um, business, and so you're not gonna change people's attitude and values, you have to change the way in which they work together. And uh, Undercurrent specialized in developing those working systems. So we developed um, new working programs for um, brands like GE and PepsiCo and so on and so forth. And one of the things that we saw that um, helped most dramatically, helped people either get new initiatives off the ground or help people stick and feel engaged in what they were working on, was clarity around what was expected of them without it feeling like I'm filling out a TPS report. And so when we started in August 2015, um, we thought about a way that we could bring multiple disciplines together and we could have just a slightly more opinionated layer than a popular Kanban tool like Trello might have. And we had the idea of creating a um, Trello, uh, a Trello-like substance that had a prioritization meeting attached to the top of it. So the earliest version of our software was nothing more and is nothing more than a thing that eats your weekly status meeting, helps people develop a weekly plan, and then execute against that plan. I, awesome. I definitely can, can see myself uh, using that since we, the, the pain points you, uh, you described are exactly also uh, some of the pain points we're experiencing ourselves and, and our team. Um, so uh, in, in terms of timing, so uh, when, when did you guys start out and how does that align with your uh, adoption of GraphQL and since Avi uh, already mentioned um, I remember you guys as one of really the earliest adopters of um, when, when GraphQL got released and um, you, you created Cache as one of the, the earlier uh, GraphQL clients so uh, how does that kind of fit into into your timeline yeah well I'll tell the first part of the story sure. and then I'll tell the story of 
I'll hand it over when we intersect it. Yeah. Because I think that'll be really fun. So we started in August of 2015. And by and large, the activities that we were doing were all around just the nuts and bolts of company formation and design and things like that. In the late winter of 2015, we really started to um, sketch out what we thought our tech stack was going to look like. And at the time, there was a fork in the road um, between uh, deciding to go with um, Falcor. Yeah, Netflix Falcor mm -hmm. or with GraphQL. It seems like you made the right bet. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> well. <laughs> Not exactly. Eventually. Yeah, eventually. <laughs> so what, what basically the premise was is if I had to write another um, like bag of RESTful endpoints, I was going to lose my mind. And like everyone knows, it's like the data is shaped as a graph across your stores. You might as well just preserve the shape and use that flexibility and power in your application. And um, when I was consuming the documentation for both um, Felcor and GraphQL, it seemed to me at the time that Felcor was going to be reasonable. And I also really quickly wrote a dumb wrapper on the top of Felcor that was called Felcor Saddle that allowed you to do CRUD operations on simple objects. And what we were trying to demonstrate at the time was that we could create a very simple real-time multiplayer demo that um, really wasn't much more sophisticated than what everybody else does on to do MVC. And we had from the very beginning of the company's formation, the idea that we were going to develop our product mostly in public and most of it was going to be open source. And we thought that that might be an, uh, an interesting leg into attracting um, talent to our mission. Um, anyway, uh, I developed this tech demo and really wanted to use it as an excuse to have conversations with other really bright folks and started to make a list of people who were interested in real-time multiplayer applications built on modern web stacks. And we found Matt like straight away because Matt um, is such a prolific writer and sharer of things. And um, well, I can say that but maybe yeah. you can say it by yourself. <laughs> and we're like, oh, we're, you know, we're never going to get this guy and like so on and so forth. Um, I ended up writing him a letter and he was living in Mexico at the time. And then Matt started talking to me about his approach for how he would do the same thing. And we ended up taking a, a tech stack pivot, which we absolutely do not regret. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So that was around June 2016 when I wrapped up my time in Mexico and, uh, before then, I had built this thing called Meteor, not Meteor. <laughs> it's hard to, to say it a little audibly and differentiate the two. Yeah, um, I was about to say that picked up quite a bit of traction, right? So I think yeah. I, I remember it when, it, when it was on, on Hacker News and everybody was it. Yeah, was yeah I remember one day when I just started getting tweets about it popping up on Hacker News. I still have no idea who submitted it, but I was like, yeah. <laughs> I loved Meteor because everybody in the Meteor community got super mad about this like real rival little framework. And I loved... I loved how you outlined, like, this is why this is better than Meteor. This versus this, this versus this. And everyone at my company, because we're trying to get off of Meteor, uh, so that's a technical decision we'll talk about at a different time. Uh, we, we laughed at that README. We were just like, this is all true, and I wish we didn't have enough, I wish we had, didn't have all the debt so we could just switch right now and do the same thing, you know? So props to you. Was you. it your intention to, to kind of like create a, a real alternative to Meteor or was this rather like an experiment? Would this actually work if you replace it? Like if you replace Mongo with X, if you replace uh, a layer with yeah. Raphael or? Um, I just basically wanted to get off the whole prescription, right? Because I want to get on something scalable where you could pick and choose pieces of the stack. You know, that was, way back in the day, you know, a year and a half ago when Redux wasn't really the winner, you know, there was all these other Redux clones, you know, oh, there's like yeah. a ton of them floating around. It's like, okay, which one's gonna win, right? And uh, Mongo was kind of losing steam and probably is still losing even more steam today, even though they've made a few acquisitions. Uh, 
and so I basically just looked at this and looked at how NPM was growing prolifically and thought, wow, you know what? I think you could get almost all the magic of Meteor uh, just off of these open NPM packages, you know? And Meteor, they were way ahead of their time, right? Like, they came up with that stuff in 2012. And to think about oblog tailing in 2012 and getting that where it is, like, that just blows my mind that they were that far ahead of the game, you know? Yep. Um, but I just wanted to try something and say, okay, you know, let's try uh, using all these open technologies. This was before Meteor uh, allowed you to use NPM packages, right? You had yeah. to use the uh, Atmosphere packages. Um, so I figured, hey, I could do this all in NPM. And then when Jordan found me, I had already started working on Cache and had, you know, you could see that I used GraphQL for uh, some subscriptions along with FreeThinkDB, but... You know, if you looked at the reducers in the original Meteor repo, it's like, okay, there's a lot of boilerplate here which could be replaced. And also, you know, how do you cache some of these same things? You know, if you have a user from your login and then you want to see the other users online, you're going to be repeating some data. So how do you get all that in sync? So that's where the client cache comes in. Awesome. All right, all right, I see. So how did, how did kind of like your, your transition from... Like you work in Meteor um, and then, then joining Parable and also working on Cache. How does that um, fit together time-wise? Where did you kind of commit time to? Where did you, like, I think, like, building a GraphQL client, which is a bit more sophisticated than just wrapping the, the than just taking care of the network layer, that's a lot of work. Um, so how did you kind of uh, decide on what to put in, uh, put in time? And yeah. how did all of that uh, evolve? Well, in the design process for what we were building, we had to pin down some constraints and then begin to work against those constraints. And um, all of this flowed from the purpose of what it is that we're doing and then the strategy that we're using to pursue it. And one of the things that we knew is we were gonna be building out in the open. And so we wanted to try and cast a really big tent for getting folks involved in um, working on what it is that uh, we're working on. And one of the decisions we decided to do was make the um, vast majority of the application JavaScript. Um, and we decided to um, create an isomorphic JavaScript application so that it could be easily indexable. And we also knew that because we were building a collaboration application, it was going to be real time and multiplayer. Uh, however, after like digging through all of the possibilities on technology that we could adopt to make that easy, things like Swarm.js or um, Scuttlebutt. Scuttlebutt or rolling together one of our own um, conflict-free uh, data type solutions, um, we ended up uh, deciding to elect RethinkDB as one of the basic building blocks to try to propel that side of the application faster. And we ended up um, doing experiments and then um, designing around the idea of uh, relying on rethink DB change feeds uh, as the earliest solution for doing a form of real time and multiplayer. And then it became an exercise of, okay, well we have this thing that can em emit a change feed of operations to um, collections of objects. How do we meaningfully and um, in a way that's performant, uh, take those objects from, the, um, from a graph representation, really. Like, how can we query it from the front end as a graph in a way in a shape that we want? How do we get it to the front end? And also, how do we avoid things like double fetches? And how do we do um, uh, data consistency and all of those sorts of things? And at that point in time, so just to set the timeline, because it is important, because it's you know, hey, it's so awesome, things change so quickly. This was back in March or April of 2016, I think. And mm -hmm. 
there was a bunch of nascent stuff. Like Apollo was super nascent at that time. Um, and Matt's um, meaty, meteor um, uh, framework had attracted attention, as you noted. And this looked like a viable open path. And to Matt's point, like one of the ways in which our developer values are aligned is that an avoidance of both an avoidance of tech debt is really important because as more and more people become developers or more and more solutions and more and more, you can take advantage of more and more cool stuff as it's developed. So if you're able to cleanly layer things um, and keep yourself open to swapping layers out, you can avoid tech debt over time. And Matt's framework approach looked like a really reasonable strategic bet so that we didn't get locked in. It seemed like a reasonable set of choices to make at the time. And yet Matt and I weren't working together at that time and we wanted to see could we work together. And so one of the things that we had decided to do was the idea of a, like a batting practice, which is like, hey Matt, how would you propose that we change this dumb tech demo that we built? And he's like, well, I would port it to the Meteor framework and change a few things. And I would also um, update the, this client-side cache that I've been working on. And we're like, hey, sweet. And he wasn't an employee of Parable Inc. at that point. And we paid him as a contractor in, as a sort of like test of like, you know, like we're not really a company. We're just like three people and maybe Matt. And so we tested to see if we could actually work together and, and um, how that would take shape. And it, after like three weeks of work, um, the approach looked um, really promising and it was performant enough for what we needed and you could also lead somebody through the layers and it made sense. And you could, you could like, you didn't even have to squint, you could just see how with the, with the things that we had planned in our development activities, they would shape out and we're like okay sweet this is gonna be fine right right I think that makes a lot of sense and I think this is one of the really appealing things about GraphQL also versus uh, Falcor um, I mean now it's a lot more clear that that GraphQL has kind of like won this race but I think what GraphQL what was really compelling to me in the, uh, at the beginning is that it's not just this one library you're betting on you're betting on an open standard that is like that can be adopted by, by everybody and GraphQL is finally like um, how you structure your API, that's like one of the hardest decisions every tech team has to make at some point. Yeah. And usually you always get it wrong. And like with GraphQL being like the horse everybody is betting on, it's like a jackpot. You, you, like one of the hardest decisions is taken away from you and this is what you can, what you can kind of count on and what you can evolve and you can like swap out the backend, you can um, replace Relay with Apollo, you can replace Redux with, with cache or whatever you be using. And this is kind of like the, um, the common thing you're, you're betting on. And I think that that's uh, exactly adding, adding to your point. And uh, I think we, we see a, um, a vast development towards this, these layered approach yeah. um, where we can easily say, okay, I'm swapping out this. I mean, if you're breaking things down into microservice and, and even serverless functions nowadays, it's so much easier to just have these small things that have a contract, and this contract is typed, it is GraphQL, and that, that's awesome. And I think that, that kind of like is exactly your, your reasoning there uh, a year ago. Uh, that's awesome to hear. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So let's, uh, let's go back a year ago um, to where March 2016 or something. Let's just say we were there. Now, uh, you're trying to build a real-time platform, multiplayer, um, and you have some options with what you've built, you're adopting GraphQL, yet GraphQL subscriptions only, you know, existed very, you know, uh, a short time ago. And before that, uh, the Apollo project was trying, is, and it still is, the Apollo project is still providing the subscription clients that people are using in 2017. Um, in 2016, what was your approach to real time in GraphQL since there wasn't any art about it? Um, and I think you guys did some early investigations into that. Could you guys explain that path? That's a fun question. So um, basically, that was one of the reasons why we chose RethinkDB. Not only because the API is beautiful, it's like you're writing JavaScript and you can talk to a database. 
but because it has those change feeds, right? And for those folks who aren't familiar with it, a change feed is basically a pub sub message queue built into the database, right? So it's kind of like an op log tail, but hyper performant comparatively. So that was easy, right? I didn't have to set up a Redis or Rabbit MQ server, and I didn't have to set up evented subs. I just could trust that the entire data layer was reactive. So that made it easy. And then all I had to do was realize, okay, anytime I call a mutation, then that's just going to kick out something new to whatever's listing, right? So those queries would just query something. And then in cache, I built out this little uh, thing where you just say at live. I took that from Lee Byron's chat a, a while back where he said, you know, GraphQL might be headed this way. I was like, oh, well, that'd be sweet to do on the client cache side, right? Yeah. So basically you write at live and that turns it into a subscription, right? And then you just write subscriptions out in GraphQL, which at the time and still is, I think, in GraphQL land, basically you have a query mutation and subscription. And subscription is basically a query, but it's called a subscription, right? Yeah, that's how exactly. It. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, I said, okay, well, you know, I'll do this just to keep my sanity so I know which ones are reactive and which ones aren't. Mm -hmm. And in that subscription, I just said, okay, start listening to this data. And whenever something changes, kick it down to the client via a socket. Nice. So um, by relying on RethinkDB's change feeds, um, does that pin you to only one data source? Like what if I wanted to be reactive on a whole plethora of different data sources? How does that work? So we hit that problem early, right? Because we had the idea of presence where you want to know when the rest of your team members logged on, right? So you want to see a little green dot next to their face. And I didn't want to store presence attached to uh, any document inside RethinkDB. For example, we have it where if you are editing a card, you know, just imagine a, your standard Kanban, right? Uh, one of the problems is I don't know if Jordan's editing a card right now or not, even if we're in the same meeting. So, you know, if he clicks into the card now, it just says editing on my screen or Jordan is editing. And I didn't want to attach that to the document because what if Jordan got kicked off or his computer just died, right? That means on the server, we would have to check every single document and make sure that that logged in person gets removed from the document. And that's a really expensive task, right? So you kind of want that to be this ephemeral state where, yeah, you know what? If someone doesn't say editing 100% of the time, that's okay. But we just want it to have be quick and not attached to the database, not really persistent. So what we did there is we set up a message queue basically living inside this thing called socket cluster, which is kind of like socket IO, but it scales vertically and horizontally really easily. And we pushed it down that way. So we would just publish to this cluster of sockets, which would go out to a socket broker and then go back down to whichever piece of hardware that person was connected to. And then it would say, this person logged in, this person is editing project one, two, three, and so forth. So by doing that, we're not, that tightly coupled to rethink DB. Awesome. And now that we've built Redis in place, we could completely get off of change feeds and we could go purely evented subs if we needed to. Yeah. Uh, so I, the reason I asked this is because I had this 2016, a year ago, I had the same issue. And I, I personally don't use rethink DB, but I, I, got, I was attracted to event buses early on. Like, I think having an, a Redis event bus or, you know, Redis is great because you can just publish stuff and, like, who cares, you know? Just do everything. It's, yeah, just whatever. And it, uh, uh, we, we did the same approach where, you know, we would just have an evented sub. And this is back before, you know, even GraphQL subscriptions existed. And um, I think that's, like, a really great paradigm. Um, going forward, and, I, and we can see that in the community, right? Uh, there are so many different pub sub uh, libraries for GraphQL now. Redis, MQTT. Uh, we had uh, we had GraphQL do the same thing. So for us, yeah. uh, our, the entire GraphQL system is kind of like based on this reactive paradigm huh. that you. As for every mutation you uh, you're doing, you you can subscribe to this event bus that could either be subscriptions you're listening to from your, uh, from your React applications. Um, but we also do have the concept of server-side subscriptions where you can um, make like 
uh, AWS Lambda functions or something like that, listen to that um, as you that you're directly um, acting up on these on these changes, and these can both be either asynchronous or even synchronous. That means like as these events are happening, you can even transform the data and the shape of it. Um, so we, we exactly picked up this reasoning. And as, as you said, Avi, this is like a, a big paradigm shift currently also happening where we are rethink to be really um, pioneered on this. And I think this will also be like a pattern that we'll see over and over again, which also decouples uh, kind of like computation complexity. And that is really easy. If you have like an e uh, event bus, that's great. But where, where we think uh, the, the, the magic really kicks in is if this event bus is typed so that you have for your data that you're, as you're listening to these events, you can even make a GraphQL query against these events happening um, and you can find like the input types and output types. So it's, it's really interesting how all of these different um, uh, tools in the ecosystem from the community, from um, more commercial products kind of evolve in, in the same direction. Yeah, so, I, I think what we're seeing is um, not unlike, and, and this is a bit more on the philosophy of how technology evolves, but we're, we're seeing something that's not unlike the beauty of um, character devices in Unix, where it's just slash dev and you have an endpoint and that endpoint has a really crisp API for doing synchronous and asynchronous I.O. What we're, what we're seeing now is like, okay, well, applications are actually asking for not things to be represented as byte strings, but as shapes of data. But the primitives that we're all asking for are all the same things. And how those things are stored really only vary on the um, requirements around um, you know, how frequently you need to get those things, how big those things are, et cetera, et cetera. And um, what's, what's fun to think about is that um, the added dimensions of complexity now are all in replication in that often you have a client and a server or two peers, however you want to think about it, that are just trying to synchronize state but maintain those primitives from the application standpoint. I want this thing synchronously. I want it asynchronously. Um, I want it filtered so that I don't saturate the connection between the two things. And then um, the last bit, and this is the part where it's really fun and hard, is you care about it in uh, you care about it temporally as well, so that you can guarantee the order of things in in certain <laughs> right, in certain yeah. scenarios as well. And um, what's even more fun to think about is like you were doing collaboration between people and humans are actually really forgiving when they're communicating with each other because you can do the old like, hey, what did you say? No, I didn't get that. Um, but when you look at the other end of the spectrum and it's machines talking to machines in the like so-called so IoT, which is what I uh, had done with my career previously, um, uh, all of those things matter a lot more. Data shapes in the right order uh, uh, at limited bandwidth. And, you know, like I hope that when we come to the other side of this, not like there's ever a stopping point. It's like, okay, now we're done. Um, I hope that it's as beautiful as um, slash dev slash some character device. And we just all agree like, yeah, that's a pretty sweet interface. And then, you know, we can actually spend a lot more of our time building user value in the application. Yeah, I like, I like what you said about the increasing complexity and like, uh, as we use event buses more, that those, those become like a point of failure. Um, and like, how do we, how do we, if we're investing a lot in this technology, like, how are we going to make sure that uh, pretty much our event buses and stuff are like enterprise level, like they will, they will not go down, things like that. Um, I'd like to take a step back from real time for a bit. I think we, we definitely covered a lot there. Uh, you guys, you guys have been doing GraphQL uh, development for a while now, and we have a lot of beginners that or don't even know what GraphQL is, and they just stumbled upon us. They like how Johannes looks, and they had to come and watch the <laughs> video. Let's give them some tips that you have learned. Like, tell, give them like what? What have you guys learned? What are some tips? And help them out. Yeah, um, I'd say my first tip, and this might uh, this might rustle some feathers, is to ditch the ORM. Right. So if you use Mongoose or something like that. I think that's just too much complexity, right? Um, GraphQL sits nicely in the data transport layer, 
And I like talking directly to the database. I don't want to talk to Mongoose, which then has some schema attached to it, and then talk to the database. I just want to go right to the DB. Um, so I think doing that, it solves 95% of everything that ORM does. And you can reduce complexity, get a little something out of your stack, and it keeps it simple. Mm -hmm. I think if you're just getting started with GraphQL, um, it's the, thank goodness the documentation set is so great. I mean, the investment from Facebook is just lovely in making this technology more accessible to a broader audience. But there's no substitution for um, playing around with something interactively. And it's really hard, of course, to try and boil the ocean when you're trying to learn GraphQL. And technologies like GraphQL can be difficult to learn because it is, um, it's, it's, it's glue technology. It is in the transport layer, so it's often not where people start solving. You know, like, uh, like very few people, only specialists are like, I need a better transport. Usually people are like, I need to write this application or yeah. I need to make this person's life better or whatever. So it can be really helpful um, to check out somebody else's application that implements GraphQL. And what's the um, uh, WYSIWYG wig open source? Oh, DraftJS. No, no, no. Uh, the uh, thing that lets you execute uh, queries interact. Graphical. Graphical and Graph background. Yeah, exactly. Man. Yeah. That, that's usually the, the aha moment for people, right? Yeah. That, that was the aha moment for me. And when I'm trying to convince people about GraphQL, that's usually it. So uh, it's, it's funny that you, that, you, that you bring it up. Um, since I, I didn't want to like, talk about this yet, but um, we think that. Uh, Yes, it is to a certain extent um, easy for people to get started with GraphQL, but I th still think they need to invest a lot of time kind of like uh, gathering all of the, the needed information um, to, to really uh, understand how does that fit into, like they need to build like an inner mental model of where GraphQL really fits in. Usually people who get started with GraphQL, they, they are maybe not technically... Uh, educated enough to really understand what does it mean to be kind of like this transport layer. Um, so where does it fit into in their in their um, in their big picture? So and and also uh, how do you really get started with something with, with um, building something with GraphQL? I think it's definitely helpful to have kind of like a working uh, example that you can look into and like see how ah this is how they connected. But I still think there is a lot of room for improvement how people can learn GraphQL. Uh, and in fact, we're, we're currently working on a, on a new resource um, that lets people learn GraphQL. So based, we, we split it up uh, into two parts. So the, the first part will be like a pretty comprehensive introduction into the concepts of GraphQL themselves. So kind of assume, puts you into a position where you say like, you're familiar with REST APIs. This is where GraphQL comes in. You have a like your, your big picture and architecture. So this is where your iOS app is. This is your where your database is. And this is where GraphQL fits in. Teaches you about the concepts of GraphQL queries, GraphQL mutations. Uh, what is the GraphQL schema? What is this all about? Why is this important that it's a type system? Um, so and once you understood all of these concepts, once you learned about graphical, all of these developer tools which make GraphQL so appealing as an ecosystem, um, then there will be the second part where you can actually get started building something with GraphQL. Mm -hmm. um, so there will be mer uh, like multiple tutorial tracks. So um, these, uh, these are segmented into front-end tracks and back-end tracks. Mm -hmm. So for a front-end, um, you might see something like React. And how, how do you build something with React and Apollo or with React and Relay or with Vue.js and, and Apollo? Mm -hmm. Um, or in the back end, how do you build something with GraphQL JS or with Graphene and Python or mm -hmm. with Sangria and Scala? And um, yeah, we are currently working on this resource called How to GraphQL. It mm -hmm. will be all open source um, and kind of um, based on the contributions of these um, maintainers of the repositories uh, of, for example, Sirs from um, Graphene is contributing the the, the Python track, and this is what we hope is a will be a big contribution to the learning experience for for people getting started with GraphQL. Since currently, it's like there are quite a couple of resources for once you kind of like made your way through the through the first eighty percent, then then you learn a bit about this. 
but uh, it's still way too difficult to really um, take you by the hand and, and, and get, get you through the, through the first three days of GraphQL. And that, that's kind of what we're working on currently. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, if that sounds appealing for you guys, maybe also you want to uh, get involved there. Well, that would be fun. We love giving back. <laughs> the, there is something that we've noticed as a pattern, you know, when um, you are an, a company or an organization and you're writing an application um, and you're trying to find people to join you in your mission and you're trying to hire, um, you... Uh, a good friend of mine, um, Ben Einstein, who runs this venture capital firm, a uh, hardware firm called um, Bolt, they're bolt.io, he's got all these great aphorisms. And one of them is that you, you hire on slope, not y-intercept. And so we're always looking for that. It's like, are you autodidactic? Can you, can you um, uh, cope with the future? And uh, that said, it's helpful if people know GraphQL because there's – there's some learning to do. And so when we start looking for people, it's like ideal if they have a GitHub profile and they've, they've played around a little bit with GraphQL and, and that's demonstrated. Um, in that world, when we find that there's somebody that hasn't played with GraphQL, but it's clear that they're really bright, they can fog a mirror and they've like grown up with technology and we're talking to them, um, often they sort of don't get the why behind GraphQL. And so that's a big tip. And, it, and the things that, there are like two things that I always tell people, like, why did we do this? Well, here's why. Um, and it all comes down to um, there's supreme value in being able to retain the shape of your data on the back end of the front end. And there's even more value in having that back end be store agnostic. It's going to change back there. You're not going to stay on, you know, um, SQLite forever. <laughs> you're you're going to end up changing that data store. You're going to grow, like if you bet on your own future. And it's always that arc between, like, am I just sketching something to validate the assumptions that I'm making versus am I investing in infrastructure so that I don't paint myself into a corner to scale? In some ways, it's like hey, if you can see those two things I just said, like just take the plunge and get literate because it's going to make everything a lot easier if your job is to work at the transport layer and below. And if you work on the transport layer and, and, and above, like for goodness sakes, it behooves you to do that because that's going to be the shape of the data that you're, you're going to be given. And so if your job is like, hey, I'm a container maker and I'm going to unpack this stuff and do a bunch of rendered components, like, hey, get it's best to know exactly how you can consume that stuff and then respond to it. Yeah, why do more work if you can adopt a paradigm or a pattern to make life easier, right? That's right. And I think eventually everyone would end up at something that looks kind of like GraphQL, but it's hard to adopt that, right? When you don't realize, oh, hey, that's, that's a really good pattern and that works at a lot of situations. That isn't just my situation. Yep. Yeah. You know, that was the big thing for me is, you know, they say I'm an early adopter, but I held out for a good three or four months just being like, <laughs> no, 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 that adds so much complexity to it. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, you know, when I took that Meteor framework and I converted it to GraphQL, I thought, oh, wow, yeah, this simplifies a lot. It, it's a little bit opinionated, you know, it's not like I'm going to be storing a hash tables as sub documents yeah. my NoSQL database now because that's really hard to do if not impossible mm -hmm. inside GraphQL. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh well, you know what? That is the best practice. I should make that an array of objects. Okay, here we go. So it forces those nice little best habits there. Mm -hmm. So so uh, one of the last questions we maybe have around GraphQL for for this show is um, so you guys thought a lot about GraphQL. You've like tried out different paradigms also, um, like tried out different ideas, how you interpret, for example, subscriptions before they were really a thing. Um, so what are like your crazy ideas for, for GraphQL? What do you wish, like if you would have the time to build yourself, what would you oh. wish that there was in the community? What maybe other listeners could, could kind of like, uh, try try out building. So, what are the, the crazy ideas you, you still have in your mind? Oh, I know what I want. Oh, go first. That's <laughs> okay. a great question. So, I want something that's either an OT, an operational oh, transformation, yeah. Yeah. or a CMRDT, right? Yeah. 
So that's like a, in simplest terms, think about Google Docs, right? When I'm typing something, you aren't getting that entire spreadsheet or that entire document. You are getting Matt sent the letter A at index three of block four, mm -hmm. right? And it's just sending these little chunks of data and hopefully they all come in the right order so they can be applied correctly. But Google Docs does an amazing job with their OT and how they work that. Mm -hmm. And I would love to see GraphQL incorporate that. And, you know, Relay, Relay might be getting there with their Relay Modern Updater function, but there's still a few things on the server side where it could become that much easier. Mm -hmm. So if anyone wants to get into collaborative editing, I mean, that's still the unexplored frontier, right? Because you have a lot of these technologies that, um, like we talked about before, they try to do everything. They try to be the server and the client. And we just want a nice little packet that plugs in the GraphQL and makes it collaborative. Yeah, right, right. And I think that makes the moon there, but that's, that's the goal. That probably makes also like offline. So, so many people talk about like does GraphQL support offline and like syncing is really one of the hard problems there. I think that, that might be also a big step towards that. And I, uh, if I could recall correctly, I think there was like a, a patch directive proposed um, to, I think that was also in, in, uh, in Lee Byron's talk in uh, I think a year ago about like features coming for GraphQL at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's exactly that, that you can kind of like, uh, that's a part of what live queries probably will be at some point, that you can send incremental changes that you don't need to th send all of this. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, and I think that that's, that's kind of uh, the, the exciting route GraphQL has taken over the last half a year, that there is so much room for people to just try, try to implement these things on their own and work, build a, a working prototype and then maybe create an RFC for that. So I think the, the best thing to really see, um, see that happening at some point is really trying to do it yourself and then uh, try to convince the, the GraphQL um, maintainers to merge it in. And I think that, that's kind of like the, the way where GraphQL is going. Yeah, it goes back to Matt's point about not, it's not just your use case, right? It's a whole plethora of use cases. And I think with the RFC process the way it is, you know, the, the, the changes that we propose, collaborative editing, per se, can be implemented in any GraphQL server or client. And that's the beautiful thing about, I think, the RFC process. Um, to close out, uh, thank you for being on the show. That was awesome. Uh, I love talking about real time. Um, to close out, um, I know uh, you guys are hiring, right? And uh, just, just got some fundraising. Uh, so please, um, audience, if you guys want to work with these two studs, uh, definitely. Uh, do you know where, where can they reach you guys? Uh, you can find us at parable.co and jobs are at slash join. So that's P-A-R-A-B-O-L dot C-O slash join. And uh, you'll see all of our jobs listed there. Um, so, the yes. other thing that I'd add is um, we have a, a fun uh, experiment that we're running that we call equity for effort. So we fully expose the backlog of our application um, on our GitHub profile, which you can find from our website. And uh, if you contribute and we accept your pull requests and uh, you give us enough of them, we'll actually give you equity in our company. And as far as we know, we're the only weirdo startup that's doing that. So if you don't yeah. want to work for us, you just want to work with us, that's a that's great way right. to engage. And they actually, and uh, everyone out there, they actually did already grant someone some equity. So this is not, some, this is not a, a mirage here, it's real. <laughs> um, all right, exciting. let's get into picks. I want to start with Matt and we'll go this way. Uh, yeah, what are some picks? Picks. Well, I think Jordan and I came up with one together. Yeah. And that you can take it away with the Kickstarter. Yeah, we're, we're hive-minding it over here. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so uh, some really good friends of ours have a Kickstarter that's running right now. And we, in addition to being engineering and tech nerds, are design nerds as well. And we love a clean, simple interface. And uh, our friends have created a single station FM radio which sounds weird, like why would I want that constrained device as a part of my life? It, uh, we got one of their first 2,000 units and um, it's the most used object in our household. Uh, it's called the Public Radio and you can search for it. 
And uh, transparency is a value of ours, and they fit that particular value. They um, uh, are building their product completely in the open. You can see exactly what it's like to start a, a hardware startup and manufacture in the United States. And um, they're also really great, smart people. And it's way cooler than I'm making it sound. Uh, there's a whole universe behind what it is they're doing. That's awesome. Uh, Johannes? All right. Um, so I want to give a shout out to Sarah Greif. So he's the author of former Telescope Jazz, now Vulkan Jazz, which is a full stack GraphQL um, framework. And I think not too many people actually know about this, but I highly encourage people who want to get started with, with GraphQL to just like try it out and see uh, whether that fits your use case or not. Um, he's putting a lot of work into that, and I think a lot of ideas taken away from, uh, I think he was really active in the Meteor space before. Yeah. Um, so I really encourage everybody to, to kind of like try that out. Yeah, and just a little note on Vulcan, because Sasha and I are friends. Uh, he's putting a lot of care into every piece of the framework, making because there's a lot of uh, you know there's a lot of uh, uh, you know a little dance around doing things in GraphQL that he wants to make easy for be beginners. Uh, so Vulcan JS. Um, my pick is from the Apollo blog. Um, I'm an Apollo supporter, and they have new interns for this summer. So. I want to put uh, this guy Shah Shadaj Ladad um, on uh, as a uh, as a pick. He uh, wrote the GraphQL subscriptions tutorial in their uh, multi-part Apollo tutorial right now, um, which is really cool. And I think he uh, he's still in college and he's getting exposed to all this. It's really awesome. So keep it up, man. If you listen to the show. And hope to we see more out of you. Uh, the last intern pound out really well, Divit, and he built a lot of great features for the client. So hopefully these new set of interns do really well as well. Um, so that's all the time we have today. Uh, I just want to thank Matt and Jordan. Thank you guys for being on the show so much. Um, uh, and yeah, we'll see everybody next time. Uh, see you later.